You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 113, the final chapter of the Zero Bone Loss Concepts Book Club. In this episode, we discuss everything from the implant platform upward, the tie base or abutment, the crown material, which materials should we use to maximize the amount of bone we're left with when we're all said and done. We finish it up this week on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. There's a little pause there, John. I mean, like tonight, I think there's definitely something in the air. Yeah, it's a um, little... It is... It's been a little crazy. <clears throat> it is springtime, though, right? I there mean, is a little something a few day- in the air. I got a dry yep. cough. <laughs> slightly elevated well, temperature. Do you need quarantined? No, I, need quarantined? I've just been drinking Corona, not having the <laughs> coronavirus don't worry oh oh okay, okay. Oh, man well, listen man well, here we are okay, the so eve of the apocalypse <laughs> here we are the week before the academy of osseo integration uh, canceled meeting I, I don't even want to talk about this i don't want to talk about it we'll hold your reservation until next year john uh Man, you know what, though? I mean, it had to be done. It had to happen. Right? Because here's the thing is that I called you about a week or so ago before they canceled, and I said, you know, I think Kevin's going to call us. Right. I know. You and you called it. You said they're going to cancel 50, it. I said 50-50 <clears throat> chance. And, and, yeah. and the thing is is that that same day, you had an internal medicine doctor sitting in your hygiene chair. Tell me about what he said or what she said. Yeah, I mean, they were just they were just talking about uh, the fact that that now um, that they're starting to test that it's 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 happening. You know, like they're going to start to pick up more cases and pretty much, you know, there's a lot of concern right now about ICUs and whether they're going to have enough room in ICUs. And she was real concerned about that and uh, talking about the fact that they're just. I think the more the more we start testing, the more we're going to know that it's it's more it's bigger than we think. And hmm. so you know, just a couple of days later, uh, Seattle, <clears throat> you know, mayor said it's a what a civil what was it civil emergency or something like that. And yeah. they were they were starting to cancel all like non essential. And we started seeing the meetings dropping like flies. It was like you know Amazon yeah, South by Southwest their thing, South yeah. by Southwest, and so we knew it was coming. We totally get hmm. it. We're, we're bummed, but, you know, we understand. Well, <clears throat> we'll be back better, stronger than ever, hopefully. I think they made the right call because, yeah. you know, if we would have went, there's a good chance that when we got off the plane that we mm-hmm. would have to quarantine ourselves for two weeks. And to take yeah. two weeks off work and sit in my house yeah. and sit here and podcast with John, yeah, we make a lot of content. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> but, but. It's not how you want to do it. That's not how we want to do it. And I, honestly, I think it was the right call. And so I, I appreciate everyone understanding. And let me yeah. tell you what, the AO did it right, right? They refunded everyone's registration. Yep. I remember you asking me, are they going to do that? And immediately we got the email that they were refunding yep. the res- registration. Yeah, they're making it right for everybody. And, and I know right. everybody's uh, I feel feeling the same bad. way. They're going to bring, they're going to be back stronger than ever. I feel bad. But you know, I feel bad like about next it. Next year's because, Orlando. You know, so it'll be hot, sunny, and burn burning viruses down. That's right. No virus has got a chance out there, man. The last time we were in Orlando, we had the cell phone debacle, which we have not <laughs> not even told that story. No. But but we did tell the story <laughs> about the waitress. <laughs> about the waitress. And you have to go back and listen to that AO recap. If you to listen to the AO one. recap from Orlando, you, it's, was that, it's like twenty sixteen or something. Yeah, it was a couple of years ago. And the story, this it was the most epic of all dinners. Yeah, the waitress caught her hair on fire. Yeah, John, the waitress and, and caught ashes on fire. Ashes went all over our food, and it smelt like burnt hair. You can't right? imagine, people. You just mm. can't imagine. So now that here we are on the eve of the apocalypse, here staring into the void, hoping that mm. 
you know, we can just make it through the next few weeks with enough masks in our office. COVID-19, you only get three three mask boxes per order from it, Patterson. It's crazy. I mean, I've tried... Sa- Rations. Sa- Safco's out, literally out. They have zero. John, you'll be you'll be taping like like paper around your face. I will. I'll be using a wide rule wide ruled me... notebook paper, duct tape to my face. <laughs> Let me ask you a question, John. <laughs> Whenever you okay, say you're sitting down in your operating room, okay, and you're doing the procedure. Uh-huh. Okay, and hygiene, Vinga goes off, right? Vinga, Apple Butter Software. Right. Not a sponsor, recommended product. Yeah. Okay, so Vinga goes off, and you got a hygiene check, and you're at a stopping point, so you're like, check the occlusion, you're done, you walk out of the room, okay? You've got to come back into that operating room, hmm. okay? Do you take your mask and lay it on the counter for when you come back in, or does that mask go with you to the hygiene room? I what, mean, what's your thoughts on the this? right thing to do is to take it off and what? to leave it in the room and come back. Right. Of course. But I'll tell you, we're having to have some weird conversations in our office right now about this. Because so you're saying like John, that you don't use the same mask all day long. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing. But right now, like I mean, we're not doing it, but we're worried a little bit. We're like, how is this going to happen? What's going to happen <clears throat> if... We just don't have enough. You know, <laughs> I'm going to go to Walmart and buy some masks. Well, yeah, but right. I don't think they don't have them at Walmart. I don't know they don't. Yeah, but we've been ordering. Crazy. We've been stocking. John, the reason why Safco's out is because Wes Mullins has them in all? his office. You took them all, and they're on eBay now. And you're selling them on eBay for fifty <laughs> bucks a mask, and people are probably oh, buying man. them. So I guess the bottom line is, if you have a if you have a mask or some hand sanitizer, and you want to make a donation to the dental guys, send it on mm. over. We'll We're actually it. having some dental guys mask made up with our logo on them, and we're selling them on eBay right <laughs> Only $100 now. <laughs> per mask. Limited time only. Okay, oh, so man. let's talk about some serious right here. Okay? <clears throat> let's, talk about, let's talk about hand washing. We yeah. don't talk about OSHA much on this show, and we're going to get into episode 112. The last episode of Zero Bone Loss Concepts is coming your way just in a little bit, but let's talk about hand washing. You come in early in the morning to work, the first thing you should be doing, people, according to the CDC, no matter whether there's a coronavirus threat or what, is you should be washing your hands for one minute in soap and water, mm-hmm. right, for one minute vigorously, okay? Now, for the rest of the day, as long as you don't leave the office, okay, unless your hands are soiled, okay, you can use a high-level alcohol-based disinfectant. Now, the minute that you sense that there's some soiled hands going on, then you need you need to wash for 20 seconds in hot, soapy water. Right. Now, how many people right now, it's interesting to me, don't wash their hands, period, all day long? I think it's common. I think it's pretty common. Now, I'll tell you why. It's because the disinfectant has been proven in an... You're talking about a, hand sanitizer, right? Yes. Uh, now, it can't be like Purell. I know, but right? I mean, I just want to specify for the listeners when you say that, because because people might not know what you mean. Like, are you spraying? You know, like, uh, are you are you in there spraying? Uh, you know, cavicide on your hands? I mean, you know. No, no. You know, like you know, 3M makes one I don't use it anymore called Avagard. Yeah. Right. But yeah, it's, it's a, a really... it's a dispensable al- right. ethyl alcohol based sanitizer. Right. Ninety nine point nine 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 whatever. It's like forever long. Pure grain repeating. alcohol. Pure grain alcohol. <laughs> but honestly, that's the proper protocol. I hope you're doing that, and that helps to spread. People, are, people aren't even asking if we're doing our job. Now, we had a debacle here in our town where a dentist wasn't doing Ugh. a good job with sterilization, yep. and therefore people are asking. Right. right? People want to know and what have, you're doing now. We have, and you all have, one of those sterilization centers. It's designed to be out in public. Since essentially, when you're walking by it, you see, oh yeah, look at that. It looks pretty nice. You know, people right. are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing. So I wonder, right, what people are actually doing these days. Right? Yeah. Are they using their mask over and over and over again? Are they washing their hands when they arrive at the office? Do you wash your hands? When they're soiled, or do you just use uh, the the solution? Uh, what are you doing? Because yeah, right? if you're doing this stuff right, you really don't have anything to worry about. That's exactly you know? right. I mean, hey, at, at the office, the mom office, always told me, 
should be a safer place than the outside world. I've right? worked for 15 years, knock on wood, 17 years in the mouth, and I've yet to really have a serious, serious problem, right? Okay, so I, I wonder what people are doing, you know? Yeah. Well, I know uh, that uh, <clears throat> I know that there's some serious issues out there. So in light of this whole, you know, COVID-19 deal, I think it's just a good reminder, use the, the same precautions we've always been using or should Mom be always using. said, don't touch your face. Don't right? touch your face with your hands. Yeah. That's basic. Just keep your so, hands off your face. I'm excited about this next episode coming up because this is putting, we're kind of putting the, the finishing touches on what we've been talking about over the last couple of months with Zero Bone Loss Concepts. So just after a moment message from our sponsor, we will be right back to finish up with Zero Bone Loss Concepts here at the Dental Guys. Don't miss it. This is Justin Goodbrand. Here is today's tip. Hey guys, it's Justin Goodbrand here with Financially Simple. In the last episode, we learned what marketing is. Now we're going to discuss the marketing plan. You see, a marketing plan identifies your specific targeted patient, what methods of marketing captures their eyes, what their buying habits are, and what pain points these prospective patients want to avoid. Additionally, allocating funds and tracking the effectiveness of these funds over a long period of time allows the marketing plan to become exceptional. If you don't have a written marketing plan, or if you have questions about how to increase the value of your practice, or potentially double your net worth every three to five years, reach out to us via financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist, and we'd be more than happy to help you. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. All right, and welcome back. And John, I'm excited about this continued commentary on zero bond loss concepts. And again, the whole concept of this book is to promote or teach what is causing bone loss, right? And what can prevent bone loss. Right. Now, I think it's interesting. We're in this prosthetic section, John, and there's some things here that I think that you're going to either be like, eh. Right. And 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 there's some things here that you're going to be like, mm, kind of told you so. Right. right? Kind of told you so stuff. And so I and think if you're... And like, we're going to condense a couple of chapters here because, you know, the surgical... A lot of the surgical emplacement concepts we talked about at the beginning, those were some of the biggest game changers. Mm -hmm. um, those were some of the things that it took a lot of discussion. That's why we took so long on those first few chapters because it was something we had to digest ourselves and probably some of you felt the same, that you really needed to digest it. This, this stuff, you're getting some nuggets of truth that mm -hmm. is, and the chapters are shorter here, because mm -hmm. it's basically, let's talk about each part of the restoration. Let's talk mm -hmm. about the subgingival portions, the emergence profile. Let's talk about the, the supergingival portion. Let's talk about attachment, things like that. And let's dive right into this, Wes. Let's talk about the influence of the emergence profile of the restoration. Kind of start from the implant up is what he's doing. He's going, okay, we've, we've got a good foundation. We started with the implant. Now we're moving up. The next thing is where do you start emerging to create your subgingival profile? And you know, back in the day, he goes into discussion on this, when we started using tie bases, which is now one of the most popular things out there, we only had certain sizes, and a lot of them were one millimeter cuff height, and they immediately got pretty wide. They went from one millimeter up from the implant and then immediately became a pretty wide platform. Now we have all these different cuff heights available and we also have the option of using customized abutments instead of mm -hmm. tie bases. And there are some things to talk about on this. You know, he, he brings up the fact that there's a difference, Wes, between what we're seeing in the one millimeter cuff height and some of these larger cuff heights. Talk a little bit about that as far as what would be a reason why you might use a taller cuff height? Do you care about blood supply around your implants? 
I know I do. Okay, of course, of course you do, right? You care about blood supply. It's, <clears throat> it's the, the age-old thing that we know we need at least, like on a safety factor, 1.5 millimeters all the way around. And I like to err on two. And everybody seems like they want to just push it to the limit and say, I can, I can slip, slip, I can just slip one right through there and that split that thing right, split that ridge right down the middle. And I got it in there, 1.5 all the way around. And that's great. But what happens when you emerge from your platform and too you quickly. emerge <clears throat> too quickly, mm-hmm. right? Meaning like you just start blowing open into this. But I don't want to get, here's the thing. You don't want the patient to come back and say, hey, I've been packing food. Right. Right? So you just soon blanch the heck out of right. it. Right. You're like, I want right? to fill up all the space. Right. Just just call the lab and say, hey, Steve, Anatomic abutment. Yeah. Make me, make this thing look like a tooth immediately. Right. Carve the stone model and blanch the heck. I'll numb the patient up. Yeah. Right, and then you crank that thing down. Yep, logical people, right? right? And so, it matters, right? It matters because blood supply matters, and if you <clears throat> compress, right, your blood supply, guess what happens? Bone will die. Yep. I have a case that it looks almost exactly like uh, on page two hundred and twelve. The on the top figure 16 1. If you're looking there and following along in the book, I have a case that looks like I restored it, look like number I there, Mm -hmm. right? It's this abutment that doesn't have any right contour, it comes up like 0.5 millimeters and then immediately goes out. Now, here's the interesting thing, John there's a lot of you out there that are seric users, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that you start to see the limitations of certain tie bases. We even talked to the manufacturer of the implant we use uh, for most of our posterior and anterior single unit cases is Argon K3. And one of the things that we talked to him about is this emergence profile. And he Mm -hmm. just finished a redesign back in 2019 of their entire abutment line to do this very thing. And he, in a sense termed the whole thing bone channels, right? Right. And essentially what he was saying is he said, I want to leave that bone there. I don't want to compress the bone. So the abutment comes out of a subcrestally placed implant up about a millimeter and then right. it turns, <clears throat> right? Yeah, and Lincoln, because this just makes a point here that sometimes you even need to go up two millimeters before mm-hmm. you start creating emergence. And he shows a lot of good cases here where um, the healing abutment has a certain taper that is much right. less abrupt, and then the doc goes to place the restoration and goes to a much wider emergence, and you, we see bone loss. So well, I it was think interesting, that- too. A lot of companies, John, mm-hmm. started coming out about 10 years ago with what they called anatomical abutments. Right. Right? And not only were they anatomical when it came to the shape of the crown, Mm-hmm. But here was what they did is they said, okay, if we're going to promote this slow emergence or this delayed emergence approach, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to make our healing abutments match our impression copings. Yes. And our impression copings match the emergence profile of our tie bases. Now, what what company are you working with, right? Are you working with a company that matches the healing abutment, the impression coping, and the tie bases? I think it's interesting because this matters. This yeah, it matters. matters. And I, and then I think, you know, if you start looking at that, you realize that sometimes you actually need different heights on both sides. Mm-hmm. So sometimes a mm-hmm. tie base isn't good enough. No. Sometimes you're going to need to use a customized abutment and still do a screw-menable type of restoration. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I do want to bring up one brief thing that we talked Great. about at the AAFP meeting. We talked to Ronnie Young. About it. tie bases. And we're going to... Hey, give look, you, you can go back and listen to that. Yeah, right? you can go back and listen to the interview. And we're going to do a little bit more talking about this in a subsequent episode. Right. But I just want you to, to think about how much do we really know about tie bases long term. And he brought up the point. He said there's really no data uh, outside of this long term. It's just the lab has kind of driven this. The manufacturers mm. have driven it because it's easier. 
Um, <clears throat> is there an issue with having a cement margin down near the bone? Mm -hmm. You know, and Linkovicious doesn't seem to show much issue or have any big concern about that in this book, but it is an interesting thought. And I think that <clears throat> I'd love to hear uh, more about that with, from uh, Ronnie Young at some point. When he first told us, we were kind of blown away by it. And he said, yeah, we're doing some interesting research over in uh, Zurich about that. And uh, I think it will be maybe something long-term we'll have to look at. But for now, I think what's important to take away from this chapter is that you need to be thinking about what size your tie base is, what height your tie base is, and <clears throat> paying attention to maybe keeping a lesser emergence until mm -hmm. you are away from the implant enough that we can preserve the bone. And especially when you have a subcrestally placed implant, which we're advocating from this book, if you're using a type of implant that can handle that, yeah. then let me just say this: you got to make sure you, that you got a gingival height that corresponds to the depth that you're placing your implant. You need prosthetic space, <clears throat> right? When doing implants, I don't think that it is. Here's what's so good about this book, okay? And someone asked, you know, and I, someone asked on our Facebook page this week. Like, what would they recommend if they're starting to get into dental implants? Would they recommend Zero Bone Loss Concepts or the fourth edition of Contemporary Implant Dentistry by Mish? And I, and I haven't heard a response yet because I asked them, I said, well, you're interested in getting into the restorative or the surgical part of implants because it does matter. But I'm thinking about this as we're recording this podcast. And I've been a placer <clears throat> since the day that I was a dentist, right? And... I, I'm a better prosthodontist. I'm not a prosthodontist, but I'm a better restoring dentist, right? Implant dentist, because I understand the surgery. Now, I don't have to do the surgery. Right. Right? But if I was <clears throat> in surgery and I saw the result of surgery and then I understood the position of the implant and how that affected yep. my prosthetic running room or my right. vertical dimension... Yep. It can really have an impact on this emergence profile in a big way. Absolutely. And I think when you turn when you look at the end of this chapter, 200 page 220, you see exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you see what's possible whenever you have the proper amount of of uh, vertical dimension. So, listen, this is this is this is good stuff. I I was made fun of, right? Huh. I was made fun of 15 years ago. When I started doing every single abutment, every single abutment I was doing custom because there were not tie bases right. that provided this type of emergence yeah. at that time. Yeah, and I think now we're realizing that, you know, we, we've kind of gotten to the point now where, I mean, we went, we started off back in the day, right? It was when we started doing this, it was UCLA cast to waxing sleeves. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. you would have your mm -hmm. UCLA sleeve and, you know, mm -hmm. people had to make like a one piece, essentially metal crown and then cut it back and apply feldspathic. And now we're, we're able to do so much more with these tie bases, but we've got to be careful about what we're doing with them and really think more about them. And, and, uh, but in the end, uh, that, that's, that's something that I think will challenge some of the labs, some of the Sarek users for sure. So moving on to 18 <clears throat> and up 18 and 19 are really kind of one thing together. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about... Well, 17 is just kind of like a transition chapter, by right, the way. Right, right, exactly. Right. Um, he did, basically, what you're doing here is you're transitioning from really might what be the dentist chair side would, would be thinking about mm -hmm. into what the laboratory technician... Not that these chapters previous would not be important to the lab. They are. But I think you're transitioning into a material-based science at this point. Don't you think, John? Oh, yeah. I think you're starting to ask the question, what are the best materials to use in the subgingival portion of the restoration. If we, we have the right cuff height to our tie base, that's kind of step one. Now as we're building up from there, we need to decide what material should be against the tissue. And, you know, we, we, we know that we have several options. We've, we've, we've used titanium for years. We've definitely... What about gold? What about gold? Yeah, we've used, we've used gold way back in the day, right? And yeah. we, we've used titanium, we've used polished materials, we've used veneering ceramics. And, you know, zirconia, although it is one of the newer, uh, the newer comers to this field, it's really proven itself to be perhaps the most kind, the most biocompatible 
Um, John, let me ask you a question. I'm going to interrupt you here because we're going to go right back to this metal thing. Titanium. Yeah. yeah. Gold. Right? And this kind of <clears throat> shows the point. A couple years ago, you and I were sitting in a lecture and we heard... The guy got up there and he said, "How many people of you? How many people use acidulated phosphate or acidulated um, fluoride on your patients?" Mm-hmm. Like every hand went up in the room, right? Because acidulated fluoride is stannous, right? And it's one of the best things to come to dentistry because essentially it's it's it increases the resorption or absorption of fluoride into the tooth structure by uh, acid etching the tooth. Now. He said, so let me ask you a question. What is that doing to the titanium abutments that we're putting in? Hmm. And what they've shown is that there is a sense of roughness that starts to develop in our tie bases, in our yeah. titanium abutments, right? Yep. So wh- where, you know, it's interesting because we don't think about these things. Right. Until they are a problem, right? And you think about the chemicals that we're using, to help people keep their teeth because right. they lost their teeth, what is that doing right. to your patient's abutments and their yeah. prosthetic materials? And I and I think it's interesting, you know, after he goes through and establishes that zirconia is a kinder material, this is something that occurred to me <clears throat> that he didn't really talk much about is what's happening with our maintenance procedures That's to these exactly different right. materials because... We know there's been a ton of data presented on cleaning titanium and mm-hmm. especially with scalars and different materials. In fact, Wes and I are looking right now into, you know, glycine mm. powder cleaning tools. Uh, in fact, I got to talk to you more about that, Wes, uh, yeah. after the show. But it's uh, to happen, it? <clears throat> yeah, it is. Um, but, you know, I, I think that we don't even talk about, OK, on day one, titanium is already potentially more rough. But what about day 1,000 after we've been through, you know, three or three or four profies and we've been through some some titanium scalers or some plastic scalers or uh, ultrasonic or whatever your hygienist is using and the patient's the other been day, eating. Let me just say this, man. I got this case. It's 15 years old. It's a 15-year-old hybrid on a 91-year-old, right? Four implant, bar wrapped in acrylic, over da- or four implant, bar wrapped in acrylic, 15 years out. Right? Yeah. Sweetest old lady. I'm sitting here and going around taking my mirror, and I can see, because this prosthetic, I can see underneath it, and we can clean it effectively without removing it. And I know the hygienists have been doing a great job because there's, you know, not really any problems. There's not perimucositis going on. There's a little bit of bone loss around these implants because of the thin tissue type. And she's 91. But all case, it's a pretty successful case. Yeah. Except... For the fact that every time I look underneath there, guess what I see on the t- on the titanium cylinders and the and the VB or the transmucosals. Guess scratches it's some yeah yeah scratches. Yep, yep. And, and I, I mean, and I think there's got to be a better way. Exactly. Right, and I think that's so important, like for us to realize, because if you can see it supra gingivally, right, what's happening <clears throat> sub gingivally? Yep. And I think that right. that's where you really need to be looking at zirconia. And he makes a strong case that zirconia should be on the underside of the restoration and that it should be polished <clears throat> and not glazed. And I want to stop there for a second because <laughs> oh, this, this is, is a so big hard. problem. It's so hard. Do you know if your lab is polishing or glazing your zirconia. Stop now. 95% of them, 99% of them are glazing their zirconia, yeah, John. Yeah, because it's quicker. But, but and here's the thing, too, is that we've talked about the, the wear characteristics of zirconia on occlusion. It's right. beautiful. But when it's polished. When it's polished, right? The, the study came out of the University of Alabama, I don't know how many years ago, yeah, right? It's been a long time. A great time. study that showed that highly polished zirconia is so kind to enamel, it's almost like gold. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And and yet, every crown, mm-hmm. right, that you get from your lab, listen, you know it. You know it, because as soon as you adjust the interproximal contacts, guess what you see? Yep. You see the zirconia pearl, <clears throat> and that's what Linkovicus is talking about. When you see the zirconia pearl show up, right. right, everybody knows what that is. That is the pure zirconia. 
That is what he's talking about here that should be subgingival. Now, do you know how hard that is yeah. as a lab technician to do? Because it's really not that it's hard, but how much easier glazing is. You know, because, oh, I mean, yeah. it's not hard to do. Spray it on. But you just, Spray yeah. it on, John. Exactly. Spray it on. It's so easy to glaze, <laughs> and when you're in an industrial lab setting, and you we just got to get Brad, the dental lab guy, on and talk about this. Yeah, he'll get, he, 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 he'll get fired up. He'll get fired up about it, and I think we need to be calling out our labs on this and saying, hey, guys, you know, if you're not glazing your zirconia, it doesn't mean that every part of the zirconia is a problem, but the occlusion is an issue, and as we're seeing here... The subgingival portion, if you care about the potential of being kind to tissue and maybe even getting some attachment. You care about bone. <laughs> right. And, and I mean, this is something that matters. And he also talks about his procedure. And I've talked about this before. We have at the RDI and we've talked about it mm -hmm. a couple of other places that, you know, when we heard, I heard several years ago when I went to a class with Stephen Chu and he was talking about making provisionals and, uh, mm. And he said, you know, you've heard it said one abutment, one time. You know, that was that concept that was advocated years ago. And he doesn't, they don't necessarily agree with that. But what he said is, you know, what we do see from work by Canulo and some others is that one clean abutment the first time may matter. One clean abutment the first time. So when he's making his provisionals, for instance, he's spending a lot of time cleaning it. And Linkovich has showed that uh, using steam followed by an ultrasonic bath uh, with uh, special water and detergent is recommended for best cleaning of the abutment. So again, more from the lab side, although you can do this in your office as well, um, it's important to know how to get these things clean because that can make a difference in uh, how much bacterial adhesion you'll get and uh, just the flora in that area. So, you know, just be, just take a look at that and look at his protocols and maybe talk to your lab about two things, glazing versus polishing and how they're cleaning the restoration to make sure you're not getting something back that's got a bunch of, you know, pumice paste on it and a bunch of junk mm -hmm. in there you don't want on your uh, in your implant. I think it's important to say this, John, is there's not really any scientific evidence yet that says that one material subgingival over another is yet to be better. Right. right. About bone. The, yeah. Right. Bone. Right. But there is but soft tissue. Um, but there is emerging evidence. Right. That soft tissue, mm -hmm. right? We've known this about zirconia. That yep. polished zirconia below the tissue is one of the best things that's ever been invented. It's where it's at. It is where it's at. And so Now another way I, to not screw up your subgingival <laughs> portion at the lab because it's now it's time to throw the lab under the bus Here is do do not make a very nice polished zirconia restoration and then veneer feldspathic ceramic to it. You're doing it wrong. So if you don't have good adaptation to the tissue where you want it, don't veneer feldspathic ceramic. Because now, as he calls it, zirconia without zirconia. So the idea of, hey, you got all this work to get this nice, and you can say, hey, look at my beautiful zirconia, but the subgingival portion is feldspathic. You, you really don't have... You lose all the advantages, so and you go with the least saying, bio biocompatible material. What you're saying, John, is that we shouldn't be baking porcelain to titanium. Shouldn't. Well, I'm saying that you shouldn't be. You should ideally not be having that be subgingival. Right, but there's sub some people that are baking porcelain to these titanium. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. That's not. I good. mean, I, I, it's not good. I think what we should be saying is the last step that your porcelain, that your, I should say, the last step that your zirconia restoration should be going through is not the oven, whether mm. it be for glaze or whether it be for feldspathic. The last step should be the polisher and should be the ultrasonic bath to clean everything up. So I think if you follow these couple of rules at the lab, it makes a huge difference. So if you're going to do all the coloring, the glazing, Everything has got to be above super the gingival, but you really don't want glaze on your occlusion either, right? But I mean, on the facials, the buckles, right? Facials, that's not fine. the lingual, right? Not the powdle. yeah. It's it's interesting. Dentistry is not easy, people. And if you want to next level your care, go to the lab and see what they're doing, right? And yep. 
and actually learn what they're doing. And this right here is, if you're interested in prosthetics and and really want to dive into this, this right here is a game changer. Mm -hmm. It really will help make your prosthetics shine. Take it. We just keep hearing this stuff. It's not just from him. Mm -hmm. It's coming. Everybody we talk to that's in prosthetics, Pros, when it comes to implants, is saying this matters more. It matters more and more each and every year. We keep hearing it come up. Yep. So, well, so um, next chapter, we're going to mm. move on to what what's really been the thing that I think has given us the most discussion over the last ten years, and that's been what do you put on top? What do you yeah. put on top? What is the material that should be used uh, on your implant restorations? to be in occlusion and what can we do to prevent chipping and wear and have the best long-term uh, result. And he starts by talking about um, <clears throat> some of the challenges we've had over the years uh, with, with veneering porcelain <clears throat> on top of zirconia. And it's interesting when we talk about why we had chipping of that veneering ceramic, because some of you that May have, I'm sure most of you remember when zirconia first came out. We had lava, we started veneering ceramic to the copings, and we had a huge chipping rate. It was like it was like 20% or something, it was yeah, crazy. But here, here's the thing is like, well, I can't only get, I'm gonna digress right there. All right, well, sorry. but but at that time, we were, we didn't know what we were doing, we were ahead of ourselves really in terms of the materials without really understanding what we were doing. and. You know, right. he, he made an interesting point here that I really had no idea about. He said, the mechanism of adherence between zirconia and ceramic is not yet well understood. There's no scientific evidence for a chemical junction between zirconia mm. and ceramic veneers. It appears these two materials bond mainly by mechanical interlocking. I had no right. idea. I thought that well, there was an actual chemical bond but it seems like it's really just more of a mechanical they analog. have a transition layer in there essentially like an opaquer that they're using right and this is where you know 3m has had special sauce they knew these things they and i told you the other day some of my best long-standing crowns were what we called lava dvs mm -hmm. dental veneering system right blast from the past those that might know yeah, about it, it those awesome. crowns looked amazing and what they did is they milled a solid ceramic crown and they milled a zirconia abutment and they fused the two together. And Brad, the dental lab guy, will tell you that they missed the boat on this because it was an amazing material. Well, and with that in mind, yes, if you here we read go. through in this chapter, what you're gonna find is that the recommended materials, because because what he said, and you know, I, I we sometimes say these things like everybody knows, like or if like somehow we've always known. We didn't know about all this stuff until no. just the last few years. But what we started hearing about at AO and the Pross lectures, probably three or four years ago even, was Emacs CAD on. And I remember yeah. the first time I heard it, I was like, what? What's that? And the idea was you want to take the best parts of lithium disilicate, the best things about zirconia, and a lot like DVS, combine those two things together. Now, you can do that different ways. He advocates in this chapter pressing lithium disilicate to zirconia and um, some of you may have never heard of that i had never heard of that a couple years back and it's definitely a more expensive restoration it would have to be because you're making two restorations this is why like you said with dvs super cool but you are making two separate things and right. so there's got to be a higher cost um and i think labs don't like this potentially as much because now they have to mill something and then they have to press something over it. But I think today, Wes, with the fact that we're doing all these other steps anyway to get a, mm -hmm. a good, you know, whether it's whether it's that we're making a custom abutment screw amenable, whether it's that we're doing a facial cutback on our uh, zirconia, uh, I don't see that there's much more work here to fuse lithium disilicate to eat to zirconia. And I'll be honest with you. It's just not something I have much experience with. You know, I, I feel like no, it's something we need to work on. We need to we yeah. need to we need to try it out. Well, let me sum this up about implants and what I've learned from this book. I think that I'm going to start moving away from custom titanium abutments because of this. Hmm. Right? 
the fully emerging custom titanium abutment that I've used for years. And if I'm doing a screw minimal <clears throat> like zirconia crown or something like that, or I'm just doing a screw screw retain restoration that has a full contour titanium abutment. I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think that we're going to have some tough conversations with our laboratory mm-hmm. about these concepts. You know, John, we, we've learned a lot about occlusion. We've learned a lot about managing people's uh, diseases. Mm-hmm. And we've learned that lithium disilicate is one of the go-to restorations for, for dental sure. implants. And from this book, it, it makes me even more comfortable. Like, right. then use, I mean, I want to use it more now, right? right. And so, um, yeah, so I think this, you have to look at this, this last kind of as we kind of close out this book. And is first, Tomas a, is Tomas a Thai based fan? It would look like he is. I think that if you're going to say anything about Tomas in this book, is that it is a Thai base like promotion, right? Like we should be using tie bases. And when you look at his results and you know how we sometimes hate it when people say this, but if you look at the results he's showing in almost all of the studies that he's shown, it's all with tie bases. So I think Ronnie Young, I would love to see a conversation with he (laughs) and Tomas about, okay, well, if there's concerns at very least, Ronnie, we don't seem to be seeing it in the studies from Lincoln Vicious and we don't seem to be seeing it affecting, you know, where he came from writing this book. Doesn't mean there's not an issue. Uh, I'd like to see more data, uh, but I think we also have learned a lot, not only about, about the surgical side, but when you go through these chapters, I mean, you could go, you could take this book to your lab, and you could start at chapter 16 or so, and you could really lay out here's how I want you to design all of my final restorations from here on out. Here's the emergence profile that I want. Here's the tie bases that you need to be looking at. Here's a material I want subgingival. Here's how I want you to clean the material. Here's how I want you to polish it and not glaze it. And here's the type of veneering that I want you to do and not do. And I want you I mean, to what fuse. What if it cost you $50 more? Right. Right. It's going to cost heck, you a little bit more. What if it cost you $100 more? Right. You're. It, right? It's worth it. It's worth it, and I think if, if it we cost look- you a hundred dollars more, it's and you're charging whatever you're charging. Right. Raise your fee a hundred bucks. Right. If it's right? a big issue, but if we think that issue. this gives you a guideline. And you know what? If you talk to your lab, and they say, ah, ah, it's just not. It's not that important. We haven't seen problems. Well, I just disagree. I think that <laughs> the more that we see what's going on out there in the lab world, the more disturbing that things are getting. So listen to this. This is a summation. I love this. He says right here, whenever possible, it is ideal for all treatment to be performed by the same specialist who possesses knowledge of implant design biology, and prosthetics, and can therefore achieve zero bone loss around every implant. Mm. Good luck. (laughs) The the interesting thing here is we've seen a move in the United States for general dentists to become uh, certified per se or educated with the knowledge to place dental implants, at least from the single unit standpoint and the easy ones. Right. And if we're going to do that at a very high level, and I urge you as your general dentist placer, I urge you to, to consider the concepts that are taught in this book. They are I, I believe they're founded. My 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 thought, my last little saying about this is that I do believe that right now that this book, Zero Bone Loss Concepts, is pretty much kind of like the new gold standard for how we should be at least moving. Yeah, in the how we should be thinking, industry. and it's how we should be thinking. Yeah, and and I think to I guess, his point, <clears throat> you know, <sighs> you know, I restored <laughs> implants for a long time, and I really kind of resisted the idea of placing them myself because, you know, it wasn't a matter of busyness. I was plenty busy 
Um, but you know, I was pursuing a lot of this education to get good at the restorative and that meant learning the surgical and understanding what was limiting me from a restorative standpoint. And, you know, I used to think, well, if I could just get my surgical colleagues on board with these concepts <clears throat> that we would be, I wouldn't even need to place the implants. And you know, what, what ends up happening over time, uh, you, people get into placing implants for different reasons. But I think a lot of people really do get into placing implants because they want to improve outcomes. And that's the right reason to get into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if you didn't get into it for that reason, I think you want to improve your outcomes because maybe you, <clears throat> you're having unpredictable outcomes. But I think what I started seeing is, you know, a lot of surgeons, not always, depends on where you are, they're just so busy, Wes. Mm -hmm. And, and you know what? They got a lot going on in their practice. They, they have a lot of things happening. They have a lot of different things going on through the day. Um, and they're very busy. And in order to pull off the type of dentistry that we're talking about in this book, you really have to slow down. You have to really think. You have to really plan. You have to place perfectly into the position you need. Often it requires guides. Um, and you have to have immediate provisionalization of some kind with custom tissue formers to do if you're doing dual zone. You have to understand soft tissue grafting really well. You have to understand how what type of implant you need, and it's not just driven by your local marketplace of who's mm. asking you to place this implant because there's more rep support. Mm. You have to think about what's really the best. And I know there's market forces at work and we can't, we can't. And that's just, this is why I think he sees the good about one person being mm -hmm. able to control it. Because if you choose as the one person, whether you are surgeon, prosthodontist, whatever, you say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to take this whole thing in my practice and I'm going to control every variable that I can. You can be a lot more nimble. You don't have to have 20 implant systems in your practice. You can have one or two or whatever, and you can control the variables. Now your overhead is going to be higher. Mm -hmm. You know, from a business standpoint, this is easier to do in a university, right? But I think if you commit yourself to following these concepts, and that's why I kind of started doing this, I was, and I started going, man, I can in some ways get better results because it's all on me. And so I better be, I better learn. So I think, you mm -hmm. know, if you, if you listen to what he's saying here, I don't think he's saying all restorative dentists need to place, but I think he's saying whoever does this, needs mm -hmm. to understand all sides, mm -hmm. all sides. You can't, if you're the surgeon, you need to understand the biology, sure, but you need to understand the pros, you need to understand the lab, you need to understand what's going on after you finish. And if you're a restorative dentist, you need to be driving your surgeon. And this is where we'll maybe just put a little bit, because I, I kind of dinged the surgeons earlier, but I'm gonna just ding the restorative docs too and say, the reason why your surgeon isn't placing the way you want might just be because you're not asking enough of your surgeon. And I think as restorative dentists, as general dentists, we, our job, one of our jobs is to ask more of our specialists. If our specialists only have to go to a certain level, a certain bar, and we're not asking more, and what does asking more mean? It means getting educated and then in a humble way, going to them and saying, hey, I've learned some stuff. What do you think about this? How can we move more toward this? And I yeah, think- If they don't like that, then you go find another specialist. Yeah, just go find another specialist. Because I think anybody that's got the humility to just sit down and listen and try to do better, and market forces are gonna push them. There's certain things they might not be able to do. But mm -hmm. at least you can try, and if you can get a, a group together, a study club together of five or six general dentists in your area who are willing to commit to this, and you can all, with your buying power, go to that specialist and go, hey, look, we wanna change what we're doing. We'll, we'll basically support you. We'll change our game if you can change yours. Now it becomes different. So let me tell you how to start a study club, right? And let me tell you how to, let me tell you how to next level what you all have learned from this commentary on zero bone loss concepts to think that we would cover a book on the show. Never would have, I would have it. never said, I would have yeah. never said that, right. but it's been a great thing. And we, we appreciate, uh, uh we're going to have Tomas on the show. I mean, we're, I mean, we are, yeah, I mean, it's contestants gonna is it's going to happen. So they, they told us just reach out and it'll be done. And so that's great. 
Okay, we're going to talk to one of the greatest minds in the dental field today when it comes to this. But what do you do from here? Mm-hmm. And here, here's where I want to challenge everyone is do exactly what John said. You all have people right now that you're going to call up and talk about dentistry, right? I have people that call me. John has people that call him that we've known for years. All you have to do is say, hey, I want you to buy this book. And let's meet up for coffee and let's talk about chapter one. You know what that is? That's a study club, right? right? And if you get enough people in that club and you're just talking about this book and then you said, hey, let's take a trip, right, and go to our lab or go to a lab or go to a show or listen to some speaker and you start spreading the knowledge, right, of an influencing people in your area. That is what collaboration is all about. That's right. And that's the power that you all have, right? You all have that power. You might not have a microphone, but you definitely have people that you're influencing. And you might be young in your career. Like you're listening to this, you're a dental student. You know what? Immediately go out and find somebody that you can talk to. Yeah. Right? Because you got to talk who, shop. That's right. Somebody you know, who you who's going to challenge you, mm-hmm. and you're going to challenge them in a positive way with the goal of lifting both of you into a better position down Man, the road. And that's next level right there, John. And that's what the Dental Guys is all about. Yeah. Right? This is a next level book, and that's a next level challenge. And so, look, hey, we we are excited about what's to come on the Dental Guys. We've got a lot in store for the rest of the year. We're going to be covering, John, I think I'll go ahead and make this announcement. Are you cool with that? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to the Ohio State, and we're going to be covering the Carl. Is it? I don't. You know, is it Boucher? Is I, it? I, I'm not honestly not sure how to say it. It's, it's, right? It looks like Boucher. It might be Boucher. I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah, let's just say Carl Boucher Dental Conference. Right? It's a meeting that, from what I understand, that the the Ohio State Prosthodontics Residency Program puts on every year. We talk to the director there. We're excited about going up there. Yep. We're going to drive from Knoxville, and we're going to be there all day covering this meeting. You know why we're covering this meeting? Well, one, because we want to support local meetings just like that that are doing things at a high level. John, mm-hmm. there's going to be some amazing people at that meeting, oh, yeah. right? High level. And we're going to have them on the show. We're going to we're going to try to do a live stream from the show if, 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 if the internet uh, cooperates right. up there. If not, we're going to record some amazing content and bring it back to you guys. So we're excited about that. That's coming up here in April. And uh, we've got some things in the works for the rest of the year as far as what we're going to be doing, who we're going to be talking to. Coronavirus will not squash this podcast. That's right. Right? It may slow us down from traveling a lot, but it's not going to stop us. In fact, if we get quarantined, you know, it'll just be a nonstop podcast festival for like 14 days. Right. Live with an N95 respirator on. I want to give a shout out to those that have reached out to us recently. Uh, I appreciate Sandy reaching out recently about the kombucha recipe. (laughs) Definitely appreciate that. And um, I appreciate the questions about about bonding the other day. Somebody asked a great question about bonding to making some decisions on moving away from certain bonding agents. Yeah, and we've got to do an update. We're we're, we're trying to put together an update on cements. And bonding right. because we keep getting these questions and there's a couple of new products that have come out on the market. You might have seen mm-hmm. some little hints of that uh, on our feed and we're testing some new stuff from a couple of different companies and um, we're hoping to have a, a shootout of sorts with uh, some old versus mm-hmm. new and uh, I think yeah. some of them too. You want you want you know you want us to have like a dental guy show where we talk about implant brands based on this book. Mm. That's something that we want to do. You know yeah. we. We we really like that kind of thing, and and I think it's important to make some recommendations. And we're not um, afraid. We're not, af- we're not afraid to do that. We're not right? afraid. We're not afraid to do that, and uh, that's what this show is about: is being, you know, so, unbiased. So connect so. with us on our socials. Mm-hmm. Give us a shout out, especially on Apple Podcasts. Give us a five star mm-hmm. review. That's how a lot of people find out about us when they search dental podcasts. We want to mm. pop up at the top because of the content we're providing being high level and high quality. So make sure you go over there right now. Give us a review. Tell people what you think about what we're trying to do. Hit us up on Facebook. Hit us up on the Instagram. Hit us up on the Twitter. And tell us what you think. And 
Give us feedback on what you want to hear more about. Uh, did, was this book review useful for you? Would you like to see more of that? Or was it super boring and you want us to get back to the single episode stuff? I don't think you're going to say that, but tell us what you think because it helps us to guide what we're going to do next. Let us know what topics are challenging you. Let us know where you're at in your practice and what might help you to take your practice to the next level. That's what we're all about. So for Wes, I'm John. We are 